Welcome everyone to today's seminar research webinar that will have the presentation by Olivier Crivion, who is an associate professor of economics at the University of Texas at Austin, also a faculty research fellow of the National Bureau of Economic Research, associate editor of the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, and associate editor of the Review of Economic Statistics. Uh, he received a BA in Economics and Political Economy from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Uh, he works on macroeconomic topics, including monetary policy, how agents fund their expectations, inflation measurement, and commodity prices. Uh, foreign, prior to joining UT Austin, Olivier worked at the International Monetary Fund, the Council of Economic Advisors, and uh, the Brookings Institution. Uh, today, Olivier is going to be talking about this work on how the firms form their expectations, new survey evidence, uh, joint work with Yuri uh, Krodnichenko and Satin Kumar. So please, Olivier, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. This is my first webinar, uh, so I'm a little unsure about how to, to go about it. But um, I'm very excited to have the chance to, to present my research. Um, this paper is uh, part of an ongoing agenda to study how agents form their expectations. And in this particular case, we're going to be focusing specifically on firms and the managers of firms. Uh, and to do so, we put in place a, a new survey of managers' expectations in New Zealand. Um, so this is joint work with Yuri Gorodnichenko, with whom uh, I've done a lot of my research in the past, as well as Satin Kumar, uh, who's been the driving force behind this project um, in terms of actually doing these, these surveys and doing the, the real work involved uh, here. So we care about expectations in general because most of the interesting economic decisions that we think about are forward-looking in nature. So if you think of how uh, we set prices, uh, if you think about consumption decisions, hiring decisions, investment decisions, all these, uh, in all these cases, our optimal choice today is a function of our expectations of the future, so how we actually form these expectations is going to matter for macroeconomic dynamics. Uh, so you can see here we've listed some of the, the standard equations that you would see in our models, uh, where we've uh, highlighted in particular the, the inflation expectation terms um, to illustrate the, the particular role that these play. So in this project, we're going to be interested in forward-looking expectations overall, but inflation expectations uh, in particular. Now, in practice, we, we have quite a bit of data already on uh, the expectations of different agents. So, for example, in the U.S., the best data we have is probably for professional forecasters. We have surveys like the Survey of Professional Forecasters, which go back to the late 1960s, uh, where we're going to have very detailed forecasts at the individual level um, for different macroeconomic variables at different horizons. Uh, and so this data has been exported by, by a lot of people to study expectations. We have forecasts even from central bankers. So for example, uh, the FOMC members release their forecasts in monetary policy reports. We have the Green Book forecast generated by the staff uh, of the Board of Governors prior to each FOMC meeting. We have forecasts from financial markets. Uh, we're typically looking at the spread between nominal and index bonds. And then, of course, we have households from forecast. Uh, we have forecasts from households. Excuse me. So in the U.S., this would be in particular the Michigan Survey of Consumers, and more recently, uh, the survey that the New York Fed has put in place. What we have much less of are surveys that are meant to capture firms' expectations. There are several uh, surveys that exist right now. For example, the Livingston Survey, the Atlanta Fed, uh, and some other conference board and IFO in the case of Germany. Now, each of these has 
very significant limitations. For example, the Livingston survey is only capturing a few very large firms. Um, and so, you know, most of these large firms have professional forecasters, macroeconomists on staff. So if you, you know, send a survey to IBM or to Microsoft, it's going to go to the macroeconomist who's going to return forecasts that look essentially like the survey of professional forecasters. Um, it's not clear though, that these expectations are the ones that are the relevant ones when actual economic decisions are being made, when price setting decisions are being made, uh, wage setting decisions are being made. So it's not clear what to make of these, these forecasts that are coming out of these very large firms and that are provided by, by the economists on staff. Other surveys like conference board IFO tend to be limited in the sense that the questions that people are asked are qualitative in nature. Do you think prices are going to go up? Do you think they're going to go down or stay the same? Uh, that makes this very difficult to use uh, for the kinds of quantitative questions that we're going to be interested in. Uh, the Atlanta Fed also has uh, a survey of, of some managers in its district. These questions are very different because they're going to be asking firms, for example, about their own cost changes, whereas we are going to be interested in uh, the expectations of managers primarily with respect to macroeconomic variables. So the key shortcoming that, that we're seeing and that's motivating this paper is that essentially there is no quantitative survey of firms' macroeconomic expectations in the U.S. at least or in other comparable countries. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing here is implementing a survey of firm managers in New Zealand. Now from previous work, on expectations, uh, we've found a number of similarities across different kinds of agents, uh, across household professional forecasters, uh, OMC members. You know, so what you find within each group is that there's going to be widespread disagreement uh, in their forecasts and their beliefs about the future. A second common feature of expectations data is that after an economic shock, you're going to see a very gradual adjustment of agents expectations uh, and so in general the assumption of full information rational expectations is going to tend to be a poor approximation for how these different kinds of agents form their beliefs so these are the, the common patterns that we find across different kinds of agents at the same time there's some pretty pronounced differences uh, in the expectations that have been found in these different surveys in particular between consumers and the other agents the professional forecasters the financial markets uh, particular among households, you know, find much more disagreement than you find among professional forecasters. Uh, and these, ex these the inflation expectations of the household appear to be much less anchored than those of the professionals who are much more volatile, be they short-run expectations or even long-run expectations. So just to illustrate this, there's a time series of the one year ahead inflation expectations of different agents in the U.S. So the black dotted line are the inflation expectations of professional forecasters from the survey of professional forecasters. Uh, so you can see for the last 15 years, this has covered around 2% with very little variation. The red dashed line are inflation expectations extracted from asset prices. These are very similar. The blue line represents the inflation expectations of households as measured by the Michigan Survey of Consumers. Uh, historically, uh, so from the 1960s through early 1990s, these have been at least as good at predicting ex post inflation as the other uh, forecasts. But you can see starting in the early 1990s, really big gaps start to arise between these household expectations and the expectations of the professionals. Yeah, so in the mid-2000s, households were expecting inflation in a neighborhood of 4% on average, while professionals were predicting inflation of 2%. Uh, so the question we're, we're going to be interested in here is, you know, where are firms along the spectrum, uh, both in terms of average expectations as well as other moments, uh, the expectations such as disagreement, and so on that we can observe. So what we're going to do is implement a new survey of firms. We're going to do this in, in New Zealand, and we're going to try and answer several questions uh, we think are of interest to macroeconomists. And the first is, how attentive are firms or the managers of firms? I'm going to use firms as, as shorthand uh, for speaking about managers. So how attentive are these firms to recent economic conditions? 
And by that we mean if we ask firms, you know, what do you think inflation has been over the last 12 months, or what do you think the unemployment rate is right now, uh, we can measure essentially how much attention these agents are paying to variables which you know, they could track fairly easily if they wanted. Um, we're then going to ask why some firms appear to be more inattentive than others. So can we explain the heterogeneity that we're going to observe in attention to recent economic conditions? And then we're going to ask um, how these expectations or how these differences in views about recent economic conditions translate into differences in views about the future. Uh, so if someone thinks inflation has been higher than someone else, are they more likely to think that inflation is going to be high in the future? Can you explain much of the variation in forecasts in terms of the differences in beliefs about recent economic conditions? Um, we're then going to try to study how firms process new macroeconomic information. And this we're going to do using uh, a few different experiments where we provide different kinds of information to some firms and we look at how their expectations as well as their actions respond to this information. And then finally, we're going to ask the question of how firms actually go out and try and acquire new economic information. Uh, what type of information do they value? What type of information do they care about for their business decisions? The short answers for all these questions that we get are first, these firms are not going to be very attentive to macroeconomic conditions. This is going to be especially true for inflation. Inflation is going to be unique uh, in several ways that I'll, I'll highlight in terms of uh, how little attention these managers seem to be paying attention to. Um, in terms of explaining the heterogeneity that we observe, uh, in the degree of attention to economic conditions, we're going to argue that a lot of this heterogeneity can be explained by rational attention uh, considerations. Um, and then that these differences in attention that firms are displaying to recent economic conditions uh, have profound implications for the differences in their beliefs about the future. So there's going to be very strong correlation between your beliefs about recent economic conditions and your views about what's going to happen in the future. These differences, beliefs about the past, uh, which is something that we typically ignore in our macro models, uh, really play a role in terms of explaining the, the, the cross-sectional heterogeneity and beliefs about the future. Finally, in the context of these experiments where we provide managers with new information, uh, we're going to see that they respond in a very Bayesian manner uh, to the signals that we provide uh, about the economy. And so they're going to respond in, in the ways that our models predict, uh, where these models uh, allow for the possibility of imperfect information. Um, and in addition, that firms are acting on these beliefs. So we're going to show that uh, changes in people's expectations parlay into changes in some of their economic decisions. Let's see. So this is uh, where we, we've been doing the, the biggest revisions uh, to this paper, so I apologize for the draft not being updated to reflect um, the most recent results, but we're, we're just incorporating them now, so I'll have most of these in the presentation. Uh, and in particular, this question of how expectations affect the actions of firms. Um, I'll, I'll try and spend some extra time on, on that because this is the new part. And then finally, when thinking about how firms actually seek out new information, we'll show that there seems to be a lot of state dependence in um, the process by which firms uh, go out and seek information, uh, which is something that we, we typically abstract from uh, in our models that, that allow for a Perfect information. So this is something that future models will, will need to come to grips with in ways that has not been done so far. So as I mentioned, the survey, the surveys that, that we did uh, are done in New Zealand. Um, and New Zealand is a particularly interesting country to focus on when it comes to inflation expectations because it's the original inflation targeting country. 
you can see in this figure, inflation targeting was introduced to put in place in 1990 after a period of high and volatile inflation. Since then, inflation has been much lower on average, and you can see it's, it's been relatively volatile in the lessons. Uh, and the first wave of the survey that we implemented is towards the tail end of this period uh, when inflation was, was relatively low. Now, with this long history of inflation targeting, you would say, well, New Zealand uh, is likely to be one of the countries with the most well-anchored inflation expectations. Uh, and so this, this makes it a natural place to put in place to, to implement this kind of survey. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, how we actually did these surveys. Um, there's actually, we, we did multiple waves of the survey. So at this point, we have six waves. The first wave was the biggest uh, and included slightly over 3,000 firms uh, that actually responded. Uh, these firms come from uh, all sectors in the economy besides government, mining, and agriculture. Uh, and we excluded the smallest firms, so those with less than 600 employees. Uh, so the sample is broadly representative of the New Zealand economy, um, although we're also going to be using sampling weights to, to adjust for uh, small deviations from, from uh, the actual composition of firms in the New Zealand economy. The way we did these surveys was we would send the questionnaires to the general managers of these firms ahead of time. Uh, they would then be called on frequently numerous occasions um, and they would provide their responses to the questionnaires over the phone. Uh, these interviews were recorded and the responses were then verified by a, uh, a second person. The response rates that we achieved were generally in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 percent, uh, which is fairly high for, for this kind of survey. Um, so this first wave was the largest. This was done at the end of 2013 with over 3,000 firms. The next three waves, which were done from 2014 through early 2015, uh, consisted of subsets of the initial 3,000 firms. So for these first four waves, we're going to have a consistent set of firms that are participating over time. It's not always the same firms in wave two and wave three or wave three and wave four, but waves two through four are all subsets of the firms that participated in wave one. Then with wave five, uh, we contacted a new set of firms as well as a few firms from the previous waves. Um, because in this new wave, we were doing some new experiments. In wave four, we've done some previous experiments on firms, so we wanted uh, to have much newer batch of firms to provide new information to. In wave six, that corresponds to a subset of the firms that are in wave five. It's wave five, wave five and six are going to go together uh, and were designed primarily to explore the question of, of how expectations and inflation expectations in particular affect firms' decisions. And so this is the part that's not in the paper at this stage. So in these surveys, we, we ask a lot of questions from the firms, questions not just about uh, macroeconomic expectations, but also questions about the microeconomic expectations. We ask questions about how they set prices, about the nature of the industries that they were in, how many competitors they faced. We ask them questions about the margins, uh, a wide range of questions, uh, only some of which we, we will be uh, relying on in, in this paper. Yeah, but the questions we're going to focus on uh, the most here are the ones that have to do with, with the macroeconomic expectations. So one of the nice things about doing these, these surveys is you, you get to ask about things that which you don't typically uh, measure in the data that are difficult to measure. So this includes you know, macroeconomic expectations, it includes other things like margins. So you can ask firms about what are their what are the markups that they're charging uh, over costs. Now some of these questions. Are, are nosy and uh, lead firms to choose not to participate. Um, but we have very few 
non-responses to specific questions uh, in the survey. So after implementing the first wave of the survey, we spend uh, quite a bit of time trying to assess the quality of the data. So one concern with survey data is always, what, you know, what is the incentive that these people have to provide truthful answers? Um, and so we did a number of checks which are described in, in detail in the papers. So for example, in the survey, we asked managers how old is this firm? So then we could go back and check those answers uh, against administrative data. You know, if we asked them, what is the price of your primary good that you sell, we can go out and check that independently. Um, in the case where we would ask one question, one survey, and then essentially the same question in the follow-up survey, we can assess how consistent these responses are over time. Um, so most of these um, checks indicate that the quality of the data is very high, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, except for a couple of a couple of checks we did that I think are interesting in, in their own right um, and it speak directly to expectations questions. Um, so we're not going to be able to assess independently how good their responses are when we ask them what do you think inflation is going to be over the next 12 months. But we can ask them other expectations questions um, which we can then check later. So for example, in the first wave of the survey, we asked firms when they expected to change their prices next. Okay, so they could give an answer well, next month, in six months, in 12 months. Uh, and so in the figure here, the blue bars indicate the distribution of firms' responses about how many months it would be before they expected to change their price next. You can see these are um, concentrated around three months and six months, uh, but there's quite a, quite a bit of range uh, across that. And then what we did is in the follow-up survey, which was done between four and six months later, uh, we asked firms about their prices at that point, and so therefore we could assess whether firms had actually changed prices, you know, within the, the months that they said they would, or whether you know, they they said that they weren't going to change prices, whether it was indeed the case that they hadn't changed prices. And so what you can see from the, the red and the black lines is the fraction of firms within each predicted duration uh, that had changed prices uh, by the time we did the follow-up survey. So for example, if you look at you know, one to two months, uh, the, of those firms who said we were going to change our price within the next month or two, basically 90 to 95 percent of those firms at the time of the follow-up survey had indeed changed their prices as they expected to. You go out to the longer durations, those firms who said, we don't expect to change our price for seven, eight, nine months. And by the time we did the follow-up survey, none of those firms uh, effectively had changed their prices. So I suggest that at least when these firms are giving us answers about the expected duration before the next price change, right, this forward-looking question, uh, they're giving us uh, answers that, that turn out to be quite good on average. A second check we can do is we ask firms, again, in this, in this main survey, the first wave, not only when do you expect to change your price, but by how much do you expect to change your price when you do? So then when we did the follow-up survey, given that we observed the prices at that point and the prices initially, we can see by how much they actually change their prices over this time period. And so what the scatter plot shows is for those firms who expected to change their price over the next uh, four to five months. So by the time that we were going to do the follow-up survey, the horizontal axis shows you what they were predicting they were going to do with their prices, and the vertical axis shows you what they actually did with their prices. And what jumps out from this figure is how good those ex-ante predictions actually were. Now, you wouldn't expect these to be perfect since you know, if there's shocks that happen between the two surveys, then I suppose firms may, will make decisions different from their expectations. Um, at least this figure suggests that the expectations answers that they're giving us uh, are very much in line with what they end up doing later. They just seem to be relatively different quality, which hopefully suggests that the expectations with respect to macroeconomic conditions are also high quality uh, information that we can 
Okay, so the first thing we do in this paper is look at uh, attention or inattention to recent economic conditions by these firms. And so we do this by asking them questions about either current, the current values of economic variables or what they've been in the recent past. So for example, with unemployment, we ask them, what do you think the unemployment rate is right now in New Zealand? Or for prices, we can ask them, by how much do you think prices have changed over the last 12 months? Give us a percentage and so and we can do this for a number of different macroeconomic variables. So then, since we know what those values turned out to be, we can construct a measure of the backcast error, which is the difference between the actual value and what the firms thought they were. So let me show you uh, the distribution of these errors from the original uh, first wave of the survey is for different macroeconomic variables. So if you look at the the green line and the black line is first. These are the distribution of errors about the growth rate of GDP and unemployment in New Zealand at the time of the survey. The first thing to note is these are centered pretty close to zero. So on average, these agents were uh, correct about what the growth rate of GDP had been, about what the unemployment rate was. You can see there's quite a bit of variation uh, in the answers that they gave, so there seems to be uh, a lot of differences in views about what these recent values actually were. If we add, when we ask managers, what do you think has happened to prices in your industry, and then we, because we know which industry they're in, we can construct the errors they made about inflation within their industry. That's the red line here in terms of the distribution of the errors that we get. You can see that's also centered around zero. So firms on average know what's happening to prices in their industry. Uh, although again, there's, there's quite a bit of disagreement even, even within that. And then the blue line are the errors that you get for inflation over the last 12 months. So you can see this distribution is quite different from the other ones. Um, and there's much more disagreement than there is about the other variables. And that disagreement is also asymmetric. Uh, so all of the managers were effectively overestimating the rate at which prices were changing over the last 12 months within a sample. And many were overestimating it by large amounts. Okay, so this is, this is one of the ways in which uh, inflation is, is unique here. Um, so we seem to observe a lot of inattention to macroeconomic variables, uh, in particular to inflation. We can ask, you know, is there a correlation in the attention that firms are paying to macroeconomic variables overall? So in other words, if a firm is making big errors about inflation, does it tend to make bigger errors about unemployment, interest rates, and so on? The answer is, is yes. Uh, so we, we, we can assess this by regressing the errors that you make about one macroeconomic variable and the inflation errors that you're making, uh, we find fairly strong correlations across these things. So there's a sense in which uh, there is a broad inattention to macroeconomic conditions overall. Um, even though the, the inattention to inflation uh, is particularly pronounced. There's also a lot of heterogeneity uh, in this inattention particularly when we look across industries. Uh, so we found this figure to be particularly striking. So this is, again, the, the distribution of errors about recent inflation that firms were making at the time of the first survey, uh, broken down by industry. So the black and red lines are firms that are in manufacturing, in wholesale trade, and retail trade. And you can see most of these firms made relatively small errors about recent inflation dynamics. So most of these people were saying you know, inflation was 1%, 2%, 3%. 3%. And then there's you know, a relatively small tail of, of these managers who are making big errors. Instead, the source of the big inflation errors that we're observing in our surveys are coming from firms primarily that are in the professional financial services sectors. So this is accountants engineers, bankers, etc. Within our data, these are the agents that are actually making the biggest errors about the recent inflation dynamics.
I'm happy to, to take questions at any point if you guys want to ask. Um, so we're, we're, we'd like to try and explain where this inattention comes from or what explains the, the variation in attention to inflation in particular that we observe. But we can think about a wide range of possible determinants of this. So we could say, well, maybe this reflects you know, the characteristics of the individual, if you're younger, or older, uh, if you're high income, or you're educated. Uh, it's certainly work in the past that has looked at the expectations of, in, of households has found that there are very systematic patterns that you can observe in terms of gender, age, income, and how that's going to affect your expectations. So in one of the waves of the survey, we asked uh, the managers a lot of questions about their own characteristics. Um, and so we can quantify the extent to which these individual characteristics are important in explaining uh, the degree of attention these individuals pay to these economic conditions. We can also think about the characteristics of the firm. So how old is the firm? Is it the number of workers in the firm? Uh, the type of industry it's in? Um, the number of competitors that it faces? A wide range of firm characteristics uh, we can think about. We might also think that the, the, the beliefs about um, recent inflation dynamics in the economy of these managers are going to be a reflection of what their own firm has been doing with its prices or what's been happening with its industry. For example, if the firm has raised its price a lot, you might think, well, prices are wrong, the economy are going up more. So we, because we measure uh, prices of the firms, we can, we can assess the extent to which uh, the, the inflation beliefs of the managers are related to the pricing decisions of the firm. Um, in the same way, we can look at what's been happening to prices in, within the firm's industry. Um, we can also think about a number of irrational and attention motives that might affect the incentive that these individuals have to keep track of macroeconomic conditions or inflation in particular. For example, if you're in a more competitive industry, uh, then you're going to have a greater incentive to keep track of information. Um, about the economy, so you might think the number of competitors should matter. Uh, the steepness or the curvature of your profit function should also matter for the value that you place on, on the information and therefore on how likely you are to, to have good information. Um, and pricing decisions can matter as well. If you don't expect to change your price for another year, say, then you have very little incentive to be keeping track of economic conditions in the meantime. Whereas if you expect to change your price very soon, then most likely you, you, you would be, you would expect that this manager would be uh, keeping better track of economic conditions. So what we can do to assess these potential uh, sources is run regressions of these backcast errors. So the size of the error that you're making about recent inflation dynamics, right? So your inattention to your recent inflation. Regress it on all these different factors that we can observe in the data. And so when we when we run this kind of regression, we find several surprising findings. Um, so the first is that the individual characteristics of the manager uh, really don't play a role in accounting for their beliefs once you condition on other characteristics, in particular the characteristics of the firm. So if we just run a regression of the beliefs of an agent on their individual characteristics, we find the standard results that people have found with households in terms of how age and income matters for the quality of your beliefs. But there seems to be some kind of sorting going on because once you condition on the characteristics of the firm, that predictive power goes away completely. Um, in terms of the, the characteristics of the firm that, that are import, important, uh, we find that the size of the firm is an important predictor in terms of the quality of its beliefs. Interestingly, the sign is the opposite of what we expected, at least at the beginning, which is we find that larger firms in our sample actually tend to have worse 
beliefs about recent inflation dynamics uh, than smaller firms. Now, in, in New Zealand, firms are relatively small compared to say what you would observe in the US. So the largest firm uh, in our original sample had something like 700 employees. So this would be medium sized by, by US standards. Um, but it's a very robust feature of this data that larger firms are making bigger mistakes, which is an interesting feature of this data. We find no evidence that the recent price changes of a firm have any influence on uh, the quality of their beliefs about recent inflation. We do find some correlation between recent industry price changes and the quality of the beliefs, uh, but it's not in the way, again, that, that one might expect in the sense that we find a negative correlation between the size of the errors and the size of recent uh, industry price changes. So if you're in an industry where prices have been uh, going up more rapidly, you're actually going to tend to think that inflation overall has been lower, so you're going to have better quality beliefs overall relative to these agents, which is consistent with a rational inattention interpretation of if you're in a sector where volatility is higher, you're going to be paying more attention uh, to economic conditions overall. And then those three rash other rational inattention motives that I mentioned before all turn out to be uh, quite important. Uh, both statistically and economically in terms of explaining the quality of the beliefs that we observe. So if you are in a more competitive industry, you do tend to have better beliefs about inflation overall. If you expect to change your prices soon, you tend to have better uh, information about inflation. And if your profit function is very flat, you have very little incentive to acquire new information, and your, uh, the quality of your beliefs tends to be worse as well. So all three of these predictions uh, we find support for in our data. Now we can also try and get at the question of how economically significant uh, these deviations from full information and rational expectations might be. Um, and one way we can do this is by looking at the persistence of the backcast errors that agents are, are making. And in other words, we've shown that this persistence can be mapped into the underlying parameters of models with imperfect uh, information. And so in this case, when we run regressions of the errors that a firm is making in one survey on the errors they were making in the previous survey, we find a lot of persistence uh, in these errors. And so if we take these coefficients um, and adjust for the, the timing differences uh, in terms of the duration between the surveys, the, the implied speed of learning is very similar to what has been documented both for households and professionals uh, in the U.S., which is a very slow speed of learning, slow in the sense that if you were to put this in a macroeconomic model, uh, this degree of inertia in beliefs would have uh, important consequences for macroeconomic dynamics. In other words, the, the deviations from full information rational expectations that we observe here are economically significant. Okay, so at this point, we we'll say, all right, we, we find a lot of inattention to recent economic conditions on the part of these managers. This is particularly true for aggregate inflation. Uh, this inattention tends to be correlated across variables. It's highly persistent. And the heterogeneity that we observe is consistent with rational and attention motives. In other words, firms are going to be paying more attention when it's uh, worth their time to do so. So what we'd like to do now is turn to firms' beliefs about the future. And uh, assess the extent to which these beliefs Olivier? are. Yes. Alberto? There are a couple of questions, so if you want to finish this slide and then if we can go over them. I think many of them you have answered them, those of Oscars and, and mine. But there are some others, I think, from Uruguay. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions now before I turn to the, the forecast. Okay, you can see them there. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking, I had the wrong, uh, the wrong chat open. 
Um, okay, so one question is, is there evidence of these firms paying more attention to changes in the prices of inputs and sales relative to overall level of prices? Um, so what we see is that these firms uh, tend to be paying more attention to the prices in their industries, in their industry, rather than to the overall level of prices. So there's a lot less inattention to what's happening uh, in your sector than to overall prices. Um, we don't have information specifically about the prices of their inputs um, and whether they so the, the industry the industry level evidence that you show gives gives some ideas of this, no? That they are aware of what is going on uh, close to, to their relevant decisions. What of inputs and, and prices they are able to, to charge or, or their competitors. I think Oscar uh, also asked this and it was already answered about the expectations being of the firm and not of the managers. You control for that. So I think managers' characteristics turn out to be not relevant, but uh, Uruguay is mentioning about their experience. And I don't know if they, they want to say more. Uh, because they're in BCU. Uh, if, if you want to take a look at what they wrote. So, yes, we, we find the same thing um, with respect to prices. We don't have information specifically about wage setting decisions, but we do find that you know, if a firm expects to change its price soon, uh, it's going to be more informed about recent inflation dynamics than a firm that does not expect to change its price for an extended period of time. Uh, so we, 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 do, we do find that, uh, that same result here. Um, I'm not sure what the question, what is the firm as informant here means exactly? Uh, Oscar said that uh, something that you said uh, when you were explaining the, the regressions already answered the question. And I was wondering if there are differences in, in the way in which uh, the macro indicators are communicated to the public. That, because it is, it is very puzzling why they might have better forecasts of unemployment than of inflation. No? Uh, even that inflation, I guess, it is reported on a on a more frequent basis than unemployment and GDP. Well. Yeah. So la later in, uh, in in the uh, in the presentation, I'll, I'll show you some results on uh, how firms seem to value information about different macroeconomic variables differently. So what what seems to happen is a lot of the firms will argue that inflation is less important to their economic decisions than unemployment or GDP growth. And for these firms that say inflation is not important to them, they're then going to say that they do not track inflation very closely. And sure enough, if you look at their beliefs, these firms are going to tend to have much worse beliefs about inflation than other firms who say inflation is important to their business decisions. So it's true that the information uh, the ease with which you can observe GDP or inflation is pretty similar. What seems to matter is uh, the return to accessing this information from the firm's point of view, that if they view inflation as not being particularly relevant or important uh, for the decisions that they're taking at that moment in time, then they're just going to choose not to follow it very closely. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, just, just make sure that you have the everyone chat uh, open. Yes. So that, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Because I, I guess had a different you have the one with Albon Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And if there are further questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat window. I'm going to clean it now so that uh, we are 
gets not designed. Okay, so in that case, let me let me turn to the the forecasts uh, that these agents are are, are making. Um, so at the time of the first survey, so this was in the fourth quarter of 2013, inflation in New Zealand was running at one and a half percent. And so in this table, you can see the forecast that other agents in New Zealand were making. So the central bank was predicting that inflation over the next 12 months would be 1.3 percent. Professional forecasters uh, were predicting an inflation rate of 2% over the next 12 months. Uh, we're also reporting the standard deviation of the forecasts. Uh, the cross, so this is the cross-sectional standard deviation of forecasts. The amount of disagreement among professional forecasters. You can see it's very small. And I said if you ask professional forecasters what's going to be, they're going to say 2%, 2.1, 2.2. But very little variation in, in those forecasts. And the Reserve Bank in New Zealand also runs a, runs a survey of households in New Zealand, in particular that asked them about their inflation expectations. And at the time in the survey, uh, the average forecast among households was 3.4%. Right? So the same gap that, that gap that we observed between the beliefs of households and professionals in the US during this time period, we can observe basically the same qualitative gap households and professionals in New Zealand. Uh, and the dispersion in the forecast of, of the households is also an order of magnitude larger uh, than we observe uh, for professionals. Again, this is comparable to what you observe in the U.S. when you look at the Michigan survey consumers. Okay, so then the forecast that we get for our firms during this time period, um, so the first thing to note is that in terms of the disagreement uh, we have even more disagreement amongst our managers than you have amongst these households. And so the, the order of magnitude of the disagreement is in the same neighborhood as, as households and much higher than professional forecasters. In terms of the point estimates, the average forecast that we had uh, at the time was 5% inflation over the next 12 months. So well above uh, anything that the professional forecasters uh, were displaying, which suggests that uh, inflation expectations among these, these managers were not well anchored um, by this, this, this metric of, of what anchored inflation expectations look like. All right, so let me show you now what's happened to these forecasts over time. So the somewhat messy figure um, in the black line is CPI inflation in New Zealand. So this is the same inflation rate as what we showed before. And then we also show the inflation rates of different subcategories of goods. So you can see inflation in food, you can see inflation in gasoline prices, uh, inflation in house prices. You see there's a lot of variation in terms of what happens to uh, subcomponents of the CPI. And then the yellow dots report the average inflation forecast uh, of the managers across the different waves of the survey. So at the beginning, they were in the neighborhood of, of five to six percent. You can see they've trended down significantly since then, so that in the last two waves of the survey, they're in the neighborhood of two to two and a half percent. Um, and that's, in a sense, you can see from this figure what they, what they seem to have done, at least loosely because it's very few observations, is track changes in, in oil prices. And gasoline prices, uh, which is something that we also observe a very pronounced way in household uh, inflation forecasts, that they tend to move disproportionately when oil prices uh, change. Now here we're reporting forecasts of these managers with respect to other macroeconomic variables, so the unemployment rate in 12 months, the growth rate of GDP in 12 months, and the change in interest rates over the next 12 months. And here there's two takeaways that you should get. The first is in terms of the mean forecast, exactly as was the case with the backcast, you can see the average forecast of the firm managers for unemployment, for the growth rate of GDP, for interest rate changes, is very similar to what professionals are predicting. Okay, so on average, they're making the same uh, predictions with respect to these variables. There's no pronounced asymmetry uh, that you can see here. 
However, the amount of disagreement, as was the case with inflation, is much larger among the managers uh, than was the case with the professional forecasters. Okay, so we continue to see this very large amount of disagreement. Um, but the bias uh, is something that we only observe for inflation. Okay, so we'd like to know the extent to which uh, the beliefs, the forecasts of a manager are related to their beliefs about recent uh, you know, price or output dynamics. And we're going to assess this by running regressions of the forecast of these agents on their back cast, also known as inflation. And when you do this, you can do it for different variables. Uh, you can do it pulled across waves with fixed effect. What we find in, in all cases is that there's a very strong correlation between the beliefs of an agent about the future and what they think has been happening in the past. So if you think inflation has been relatively high, then you're very likely to be predicting that inflation will continue to be high in the future. If you think the economy has been growing more rapidly than someone else, then you're more likely to be optimistic uh, about the future growth rate of GDP as well. So there's a very strong correlation between these differences in beliefs about the recent past and the differences in beliefs that we observe about the future. And the same forces that we observe as being important drivers of inattention to recent economic conditions, uh, surprisingly, are also very strong predictors uh, about your beliefs about the future. So for example, these three rational inattention forces that we talked about before, the amount of time before your next pricing adjustment, the number of competitors, or your curvature of the profit function, uh, are both closely linked to your average belief about recent inflation, so here this is the, the horizontal axis, as well as your average belief about future inflation. So what we do in this figure is we take groups and, and we break them uh, into different uh, subgroups based on either when they expect to change their prices next or how many competitors they have or the curvature of the profit function. And then for each group, we report their average belief about recent inflation and their, recent, and their average forecast of future inflation. All right, so what this says, for example, is if you're one of the firms that expect to change your prices in the next three months, on average, these firms think inflation has been running at about 4% and expect inflation to be about 55 to 6% over the next 12 months. But if you look at firms who don't expect to change their prices for more than a year, their expectations of both recent inflation and future inflation are about twice as large. And we observe the same pattern in terms of the number of competitors. If you face fewer competitors, your beliefs about recent inflation are worse and your forecasts of future inflation are significant. Now, those, those three categories are, seem to be invariant to time. Nonetheless, there, there seems to be uh, learning that happens uh, over time. So firms are not uh, unchanging in terms of the degree of attention that they're paying to, to economic conditions. One way to see this is we take the firms in the first wave and we break them into two groups. One group, what we call the informed group, and these are the firms who report a backcast of inflation, which is within two percentage points of the actual value. In other words, so if you said inflation has been running at 1%, 2%, 3%, we're going to call you informed. And then the firms who reported that in, they thought inflation was running at higher levels, we call uninformed. And then in this figure, what we show is the distribution of inflation forecast for these two groups. Right, so what you can see is that the, the distribution for the informed firms uh, is much less diffuse than the distribution of the uninformed firms where you see many more very high inflation forecasts. Okay, and then what we can do is we can leave firms in these two groups, okay, the informed group and the uninformed group, and look at their beliefs in later waves. Okay, so then this figure, 
now we show the distribution of inflation forecast for those same two groups of firms but now in the fourth wave of the survey so about two two years later and so what you can see in this figure is that most of the differences in the beliefs have uh, dissipated over time so who is informed who is uninformed two years before uh, does not have much bearing at that point um, on your beliefs later on. Okay, so these firms are, are learning over time uh, and there's churning in terms of who's paying attention to this thing. I would suggest that we would like to know how these firms are, are learning, how do they respond when they're presented with new information. And so to answer this question, we did uh, a sequence of experiments uh, on, the, on the managers. And so in the fourth wave of the survey, what we did was we solicited their beliefs about economic variables, and then subsets of firms were provided with information, true information about some of these variables. And after they got this information, we asked them um, about their, their new beliefs about these variables so that we can see to what extent did their beliefs change in the face of this new information. Okay, so we did this for, for different kinds of macroeconomic variables. So let me show you first uh, what happened with when they were provided information about the growth rate of GDP or the most recent unemployment rate. All right, so in each of these figures, what you have on the horizontal axis is the prior beliefs about these firms for, say, unemployment in the left corner. And then on the vertical axis, their posterior belief about the unemployment rate after they were told what the most recent value of the unemployment rate actually was. Okay, so what you can see is that the slope of the line that fits through here is flatter than the 45 degree line, right? which says on average, if you thought the unemployment rate was 8%, and we tell you, well, the, the, the most recent unemployment rate is actually quite a bit lower, so now when you think the unemployment rate will be in 12 months, you're gonna revise down your belief about the future unemployment rate exactly as you would expect uh, from the signal extraction setup. And we observe the same thing for unemployment and GDP. Now what you can see though in this figure is that the slopes of the line of the lines uh, they're, they're not very flat, which says that these agents are they're not revising their beliefs all that much in light of the information that you're giving them. So they're putting a lot of weight on their prior beliefs when it comes to unemployment and GDP. Now we then redid this experiment on different firms with information about inflation. Now in this case, we, we, we had five different groups of firms who were provided five different kinds of information so that we could say something about which information moves the beliefs more. Uh, so one group of firms was told what professional forecasters were predicting for inflation over the next 12 months. Now it's a rate of 2%. Uh, another group of firms was told what the central bank's inflation target was, was 2%. A third group of firms was told both of those pieces of information. The fourth group of firms was told about the most recent uh, value of the inflation rate, which at the time was 1%. And the fifth group was told that other firms in the survey were predicting an inflation rate of 4.9%. Okay, so again, with these firms, we have their initial beliefs about inflation. We have the uncertainty about their beliefs of inflation, which we can measure by asking questions uh, about the distribution of possible inflation outcomes. So we know their prior beliefs, their prior uncertainty. And then after providing them with this information, we ask them again, what do you think uh, about inflation over the next 12 months? So we can measure their prosperity. 
Okay, we expect again two things to, to be happening. One is you know, if you thought inflation was high and you're providing the signal that suggests inflation is going to be lower, you should be moving your beliefs towards that signal. So you should be revising your inflation downwards. And you should do so more when you think the signal is more credible. And you should do so more when uh, you're initially very uncertain about your beliefs. And so we assess this, uh, all these predictions um, in this table. So the first number that you see here uh, is 0 0.30. This is regressing the posterior of these firms on their prior beliefs, pooling across all the different kinds of information that they got. Okay, so this is comparable to the slope that we were reporting for the GDP and the unemployment forecasts in the, in the previous figures. So now this slope is much flatter than what we were getting with GDP and unemployment. Okay, now the, the fact that the coefficient is, is positive is saying these, uh, these firms are moving their posteriors towards the signal that they receive while still putting some weight on their prior, but the weight that they're placing on their prior beliefs with respect to inflation is very small. In panel B, what this coefficient indicates is that uh, a firm that's more uncertain places more weight on the signal that they receive, exactly as you would, you would expect in the Bayesian setting. Okay, so if you're initially more uncertain about what inflation is going to be, and I provide you some information about inflation, you're going to move uh, your beliefs by more. And then we can ask, well, do we find... Uh, the same response for different kinds of information that were provided uh, to these firms? And the answer is no. The slopes, so the weight that's placed on the prior beliefs of the agents is smallest when they're told about the central bank's inflation target. In other words, managers revise their beliefs by more when they're told that the central bank is targeting 2% inflation than when they're told uh, say that professional forecasters are predicting an inflation rate of 2% over the next 12 months, which can be interpreted as the signal about the central bank's target is more credible than the signal coming from the professional's forecast. The least informative signal, uh, according to, this, to this, these results, is when the firms are told what other firms are predicting. So that's in column six. You can see then the weight that they're placing on their prior is much larger than the weight they place on their prior when they're told about the central bank's inflation target. Okay, so we see these agents revise their beliefs um, in a very pronounced fashion, especially their beliefs about inflation when they're provided with these signals. So then what we would like to then answer is when you're presented with this information which changes your beliefs, does it actually have any impact on your decisions? Okay, so do firms respond in any economic way to changes in their beliefs about inflation in particular? So we did a different experiment to try and answer this question, um, focusing specifically on, on how the firm's actions may respond to changes in their beliefs. Uh, we tried to do this in a causal way, building on this previous experiment. Now, specifically, what we did is in the fifth wave of the survey, we first asked a group of new firms what they expected they were going to do with their prices, their hiring, their wages, and their investment over the next six months. Okay, so we have an initial uh, plan for each of these firms and what they're going to do with these variables. Okay, and then we also solicit their beliefs about inflation and other macroeconomic variables at the time of the survey. Then what we did is at the end of this wave, some of these firms were provided information about the central bank's inflation target. Okay, so we know from this previous experiment that 
uh, information about the inflation target is going to lead to pretty significant revisions in inflation expectations on these agents if you don't already know what that inflation target is. Okay, so we're providing this information, which is going to lead to an immediate effect on some of these agents' expectations. And then in the next wave, which was done six months later, we asked firms specifically about what they did with their prices, their hiring, their wages, their investment over the last six months. Okay, so in this experiment, we change people's beliefs by providing them with this information. And then we can assess whether their employment, their wage, their investment decisions deviated from their plans more right, when they were revising their inflation expectations by more. So, we find that the answer is, is yes, uh, changes in these expectations do affect uh, the outcome. So in this table, what we do is we put firms into two groups based on their initial beliefs about the New Zealand Central Bank's inflation target. So in column two, we have those firms that thought the target was one, two, or three percent. In column one, we have those firms that thought the inflation target was four or more percent. Okay, so when we give information about the central bank's actual target, those firms that thought the target was between one and three percent, then over the next six months, we don't see any difference on average between what they do with their wages, their investment, their employment, and their prices relative to what they were predicting and firms that weren't given any information. Okay, on average, they, they, they all do follow their plans more or less closely, but there's no systematic deviation in terms of the behavior relative to firms that didn't get the information. Now, if we look at the firms who initially thought that the RBNZ's inflation target was 4% or more, then when we give them the information about the central bank's inflation target, on average, at the time that we give them the information, they then revise down their inflation expectations by about one percentage point on average. Okay, so contemporaneously at the time of the information, they reduce their inflation expectations significantly. Now, six months later, there's not really any longer any difference between their inflation expectations uh, and anyone else's. And so the these, this revision in inflation expectations from the information that we provide is transitory. Nonetheless, over the next six months, this change in the beliefs about inflation, at least at the beginning of the period, leads to lower investment and lower employment relative to what these firms were originally predicting and relative to uh, what firms that did not get any information were expecting. Okay, so we don't see an effect, a statistically significant effect on prices or on wages, uh, but we do see, though the signs go in, in the correct direction, uh, but we do see statistically significant, and really these are economically big responses uh, in terms of employment and investment, right? Because if you revise down your inflation expectation by 1%, then assuming you're not changing your belief about the nominal rate, your real rate is going up by one percentage point, and then these firms are reducing their employment by three percentage points, or the growth rate of employment by three percentage points relative to their plan, and their investment by two percentage points relative to their plan. Okay, so these are big elasticities uh, relative to inflation expectations when you uh, induce these expectations to change. Okay, so these firms are responding uh, to their beliefs in an economically significant way. Okay, so the final um, kind of questions we'd, we'd like to answer in, in the time that remains is, you know, here we've learned how do firms respond when we provide them with new information, but in an exogenous way. Uh, what we'd like to know is, well, how do firms actually go out and acquire new information on their own? What kind of information are they looking for and why? So we did a number of things here, and these 
are somewhat more qualitative in, in nature than, than what we've done before. Um, so first, as I mentioned before, we asked managers to tell us how to rank uh, unemployment, GDP, and inflation in terms of how important these different variables were to them in terms of their business decisions. Okay, so what we find is, first, about half of the firms say inflation is the least important variable out of these three for those big for their business decisions. Okay, so they should they should care more about GDP and they care more about unemployment on average than they care about inflation. And then what we find is that firms which rank one variable higher, so if you say unemployment is your the most important variable, then you tend to have better information about recent unemployment dynamics than other firms. And you also tend to have less uncertainty in your forecast about that variable, as you would expect. It would suggest that a lot of the, the quality of the beliefs uh, that these firms have over different macroeconomic variables reflects how important they think uh, these variables are to their decisions. And then in a very similar uh, spirit, we then ask firms, well, which variables do you actually track? And so this table uh, reports the, the different kinds of answers that we get. So for example, 22% of firms report that they track inflation, unemployment, and GDP. Um, you know, the largest group is the, the firms who report that they care about both unemployment and GDP. That's about one third of firms. And kind of strikingly, 60% of the firms in our sample report that they just do not track inflation at all. Okay, that this is not a variable uh, that they're actively tracking uh, as part of their, their business decisions. And not surprisingly, there's a very high correlation uh, between the rankings that firms assign to these different variables in terms of how important they are for their business decisions and whether they choose to follow them or not. So, for example, of the firms who rated inflation uh, the most important for the business decisions, so we rank it a one, right, then almost every single one of them is then going to say that they follow inflation. Of the firms who say inflation is the least important for their business decisions, almost all of those firms then say they just don't follow inflation. Okay? And even amongst the firms who report inflation is the second most important variable, the vast majority of those firms also then say that they don't report, that they don't follow inflation. Okay? So it's really only the firms that are saying that inflation is the most important out of those three variables to their business decisions are then actually going to be tracking uh, inflation. Okay, and just as with um, the results that we had with those firms who say if the variable is more important to their business decisions, they tend to have the better beliefs, we observe large differences uh, in terms of the quality of the beliefs based on whether these firms report that they follow or don't follow a variable. So if they say that they follow inflation, the average backcast error that we observe is one percentage point, whereas those firms that don't follow inflation, the average backcast error is five percentage points. There are also big differences in terms then of their forecast as well as the uncertainty that they report in their forecast. So if you follow inflation, you display less uncertainty in your forecast uh, than if you say that you don't follow. Okay, so we interpret these uh, results as, as suggesting that uh, you know, the fact that firms seem so uninformed about aggregate inflation on average is reflecting a conscious choice on the part of many of them uh, to simply ignore inflation because they don't view it as a sufficiently uh, important variable in their business decisions. Now, the generality of this result is probably somewhat limited, right, in the sense that this is New Zealand uh, and this is a country where inflation has been low and has been stable for an extended period of time. Um, the limited evidence that's available for the U.S. suggests very similar beliefs on the part of firm managers in the sense that when they're asked about 
uh, what do you think is going to happen to prices over the next 12 months over a very similar time period. They also reported very high inflation forecasts uh, on average. But in higher inflation uh, countries or countries where inflation has been more volatile, this doesn't seem to be as much the case. For example, there's a survey of firm managers that was very recently done in Iran where inflation has been running has been tracking down from the 20% and is now in the neighborhood of 14%. The managers were asked, what do you think inflation has been over the next 12 months? Uh, on average, they got the most recent inflation numbers correct, and the dispersion in those beliefs was quite small relative to what we see uh, in New Zealand. Uh, so this, this view that inflation is not uh, that important for business decisions seems to be a reflection of the low and stable inflation that has been achieved in these countries um, and would likely not be true to the same extent in, in other countries. Um, okay, so I see I see a couple questions. So one is, this is like in sports where things work better when players and spectators do not care about the rules or the role of the referees. I guess these numbers were very different when inflation was in double digits. Yes, so I think that's, that's it's very likely to, to have been the case. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, evidence from, from other countries like Iran where inflation has been higher or more volatile uh, to see whether, uh, in fact, firms do seem to be paying much more attention uh, in those settings than they have been in New Zealand. Um, So do firms say that they do not care about inflation, think that inflation is anchored with the central bank target? Um, yes, yeah, so it's generally the case in our survey that uh, firms who follow inflation have a better knowledge of the central bank's inflation target. Um, and it's also the case that uh, that their long-run forecast of inflation will be close to what they think uh, the target is. So the comment is maybe I do not care about inflation because I think it is uh, taken care of. Um, yes, I, th I think I think that's that's the right interpretation. Right? So another interpretation would be, I don't care about inflation uh, at all, and so then I'm even uninformed about what the target is. Um, Um, no, so that's, that's not quite right. Uh, so the more the more informed firms about inflation overall are also better informed about what the target is. Um, so the less informed ones are also less informed about uh, the target. So I, I, I don't know that we would say that the, their expectations are particularly anchored uh, per se. Okay, um, all right, in the last few minutes, um, so a little bit about the kinds of, or how, how firms seek out, or when, when they seek out new information. Um, so we asked these firms two questions uh, in terms of timing. One is, suppose you hear on television that the economy is doing poorly, would this make you more likely to look uh, for additional information? All right, so like in a time-dependent model, the answer that should come out of this is, is there should be no change in terms of how likely you are to look for more information. What we find, not surprisingly, is that uh, most managers report that this bad news about the economy makes them more likely to seek out more information. So there seems to be state dependence in this information acquisition. Uh, but it's asymmetric information uh, asymmetric information, state dependence, in the sense that if you ask them 
the flip side of that question, so suppose you hear that the economy is doing well, does this make you more likely to look for more information? The answer for most of them is no. This makes you actually less likely uh, to look for more information. Okay, so good news tells you that you can you can fly blind for a while. Bad news tells you that you should go out uh, and try and collect more information. Uh, so there's an asymmetry in the state dependence of the information acquisition process. And the, the final part of, of our results has to do with uh, the degree to which strategic complementarity and pricing decisions can influence the type of information and the timing of information uh, acquisition that firms will tend to do. So the literature looking at uh, information selection has emphasized the potential importance of strategic complementarity. In other words, how much you care about the price setting decisions of others when you're setting your own prices. Now what these models have suggested is when you're in a setting where there's a lot of strategic complementarity price setting, so it matters to you what prices other firms are choosing, then firms should uh, be paying more attention to public signals than private signals because a public signal is telling you uh, something not only about the underlying state but also about what the other firms are likely to do. And in the face of uncertainty, then these firms should be more likely to wait for other firms to move first um, to help them draw inference about uh, the state of the economy because in a in the setting with strategic complementarity, other firms' actions are more informative about the underlying state, and so finally, firms should be extracting more information from the actions of other firms um, than in the absence of the strategic complementarity. And so we asked firms several questions meant to, to get at, the, at, uh, at these decisions. Um, and so first, we asked some questions that were meant to measure uh, complementarity in prices, um, which is, which is, so we can't perfectly measure strategic complementarity in price setting, but we can capture some of its components. Uh, and then what we did is we asked firms, suppose you have a choice about over two sources of information. One is observed only by you, one is observed uh, by other firms as well. Which one would you prefer? So what we find is that firms that tend to have more strategic complementarity in their price setting are more likely to report that they're going to want to see the signal that other firms are seeing, which is exactly the prediction that these theories are, are making. And in addition, um, if you if you we, we find that the firms that uh, face more strategic complementarity in price setting are also more likely to do this delay in their decision uh, making that you would expect. Uh, for uncertainty to be resolved. And this comes from a question where we asked managers, suppose you want to adjust your prices, uh, but you're uncertain about the state of the economy. What would you do? And we give them a number of options, one of which is wait until the other firms make a price adjustment first. So as expected, when firms uh, face more strategic complementarity, they're more likely to choose this option of waiting for other firms uh, to, make it, uh, to make their own pricing decisions. And then finally, what we see is that when these firms say, yes, I'm, I'm more likely to wait for these other firms uh, to make their own adjustments before I make my adjustment, then what we see is that these firms also report that they're extracting more information from the pricing decisions of other firms uh, than do firms that aren't in this environment of strategic complementarity. Specifically, we ask firms, if your competitor raises the price of its product by 10%, by how much would you revise your expectation of inflation? How sensitive is your belief to the actions of these other agents? And so sure enough, when these, these firms face more strategic complementarity of price setting, when they're more likely to be waiting on the actions of other firms, they're also extracting more information from, these act, from the actions of their competitors, which is exactly what the students would predict. So to, to summarize, what we find from these surveys is uh, pervasive evidence of inattention on the part of managers to recent economic conditions. Uh, this is particularly true for, for inflation, 
I tried to argue that a lot of this inattention seems to be consistent with rational inattention motives, um, and that this inattention, inattention to recent conditions then parlays into uh, differences in beliefs about the future, as well as, in some sense, poorly behaved uh, beliefs about the future when it comes to inflation. Now, when you present firms with new information, they respond in a typical Bayesian manner in terms of their beliefs, and these changes in their beliefs do have an effect in terms of their actual decisions. Okay, so firms are responding to their beliefs about inflation. And the way they go out and acquire information is state dependent. It's particularly sensitive uh, to bad news. And it depends, it seems to depend to a large extent, on how much they value information about these different macroeconomic variables. And more broadly, this inattention to macroeconomic conditions, and especially inflation expectations, uh, suggests that a lot of the communication strategies the central banks have been thinking about and even using uh, that are meant to operate by changing people's expectations of, in, of inflation are unlikely to be as successful as you would expect from a standard model uh, because people don't seem to be paying attention, uh, that much attention to the economic conditions. And so communication strategies are likely not moving the expectations of managers uh, or the expectations of households nearly as much as you would think from one of our standard models and therefore not affecting decisions as much as, as we would think. Um, Again, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to present okay. uh, my research here today. And I'm happy to take any more questions if, if there are more. I enable everyone's microphone so you can feel free to enable it if you, if you want. So you mentioned that you, you are working on a, Parallel surveys uh, at other countries apart from from Iran. Uh, are you analyzing uh, other countries, Olivier? Yeah, we're we're trying to put in place a similar survey okay. in the U.S. Um, and then I, I have a student who's uh, who's been who put in place the survey. And the survey is available. A, um, I, I remember that at the end of the, a similar the paper there were place in other countries as well. some sample questions. And so those are in general because you have there the different waves. Online appendix, okay. Yeah, so we, we, we provide uh, we provide the, the the questions that are used in this paper and, and replication materials. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's not. And it's, and the different groups have been keeping questions that, a, you know, in the process of adding that. Core of questions, but you have been adding different aspects that you you realize that would be important to measure. Is that right? Yeah, so un unfortunately, when we started the survey, we didn't, we didn't know that we were going to be able to do multiple waves of the survey. And so we did not design the questions uh, to fully exploit the panel nature of the data that ultimately we have. Um, you know, it was like after we did the, the first wave, which we thought was just going to be one cross section, it turned out we had additional resources okay. to do a second wave. And so we did the second wave, not knowing that we were going to be able to do a third wave, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's some respects in which, you know, we would have liked much more continuity in the questions that we asked. I didn't know we'd be able to, to look at okay. it multiple times. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, do have 
questions, I guess in, there will be some other opportunities to talk with the, with Olivier in the in the coming months. But uh, if if not, what I'm going to do is to thank you on behalf of those who participated today, and we appreciate that you also allow us to to record the the meeting and. We will be in contact and we'll meet again next next week. Uh, okay, I see that there is one question coming. So but next week uh, we'll have Rudy uh, Bashman from Notre Dame University, uh, who is going to be talking about expectations are observables and we haven't even started yet. Okay.